Welcome to Coaching Conversations in Cannoli, where we take the opportunity to expose diverse solutions and perspectives uh, to many cross-disciplinary challenges that professionals, coaches, leaders, innovators all face. Uh, today, I'm blessed not only uh, be filming this episode on the site of the global headquarters for uh, Bennett Financial, uh, but here is guest, longtime friend, Justin Bennett, uh, fellow girl dad, but also with a son. So you're a little bit better than I am at that one. I keep swinging. It was missing. luck. It was luck. It was sure hat backwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, you do truly excel as an advisor, and we are in the the brains uh, or the or the the war room of the organization here as we're recording. So you'll notice the background is a little unique. We are surrounded by just a very small sampling of the acknowledgments of of just how psycho you are <laughs> when it comes to not only achieving as a professional, as a financial advisor, as an advisor, period, uh, all caps, period, but also as an individual who's very focused on your health, on fitness, on challenging yourself and pushing yourself way beyond the limits of not just normal individuals, but even fellow psychos. And you go even past them for another dozen or so miles uh, on the routine. By the way, life's a journey. So, you know, Doing the normal thing is not very enjoyable. It's not enjoyable, no, yeah. It's no. kind of boring yeah, when you're yeah. running this long. It becomes a little monotonous. So you Over gotta... 100 miles of running, I would imagine it would get a little monotonous. <laughs> so you're like, eventually it's going to get better, right? <laughs> um, so he is an ultra marathoner. I've known Justin for almost 20 years. We're almost celebrating right. our, uh, the completion of two decades of knowing each other on earth. We are here in Central Jersey at Bennett Financial with Justin Bennett. He is a super dad. He's... he's a man in a very dynamic household. He's a husband to a wonderful wife, and the children really do have a knack for bringing out some of the best in you. So we're gonna talk about all that. In particular, I wanna get into, you were just in Central Florida at a world championship? So um, our oldest daughter is Ellie. into Ellie's into the equestrian stuff. And it's new to my wife and I, and we grew up playing basketball, and so I'm still trying to give her the bounce pass each morning sure. to see if she wants to play basketball. But she's really taken to this whole equestrian thing. And so um, the world is pretty big in equestrian uh, terms because you know there's a whole world of opportunities out there. So they have these facilities throughout the country. One of them is in Florida, two of them actually in Florida, and one of them in Ohio. So we were just in Ohio, Wilmington, Ohio, which is no man's land, mm. flying to Cincinnati, which is technically in Kentucky, and drive about an hour and a half uh, to Wilmington, Ohio. So we're at the World Equestrian you Center. You fly the horse in? <laughs> the horse gets transported via... Um, I mean, I know it's an expensive... A tractor trailer, sport. you know? So, um, so uh, yeah, so, so the barn has, the barn that she trains at has a handful of horses that got into, got loaded onto this tractor trailer, and... They transported these horses from New Jersey out to Wilmington, Ohio. And you and you support, you coach, you counsel, you're a rider. And, and that's a little bit different than you're used to for your own world. So just talk about that with Ellie in particular as a rider. How do you engage in all the ways that you do otherwise? How do you engage as a dad, as a coach, as a supporter? You know, I think all of our kids are super active in their respective sports and areas. Yes, Ellie's th doing the equestrian thing, which, you know, at the level at which she's at and continuing to aspire to be at, there's no time for any other sport. Um, and she has a deep, deep-rooted passion and love for it. So she's happy. We're happy as a result, right? I sure. mean, you know, any of the girls are happy. You're a happy dad. It definitely helps the house out, yeah. And, uh, and our middle one is, you know, loves the basketball and the baseball and he's fully entrenched in travel and you know going here and going there and practicing and training and um, he likes anything with a ball frankly but from an organization standpoint on teams he's you know baseball and basketball uh, Cooper's year round. More Cooper's more traditional. He's more traditional. He those team unified sports. Yeah yeah, yeah. which is good. And then Alaire, um, she found her kind of thing in soccer and so she does really really competitive travel soccer and you know I was talking to a father last night and, um, you know, I was saying that I think the youngest, our eight-year-old, appreciates um, playing soccer because it gives her identity separate and apart from the other two. So there's not overlap and there's not like, hey, my brother or my sister is doing, 
you know, this with this particular sport, which, happen, which happens to be the same as mine. She's got her own identity. She's playing soccer. Cooper stinks at soccer. <laughs> Ellie stinks at soccer. You know, like she's pretty good at soccer. So it's like, hey, everything works out great. You know, everybody kind of finds their thing and they, they, they have some fun. And I would have just thought, you know, you get to pour a lair and you're like, well, we spent everything on the horses. Uh, so I don't know, we got, we got the soccer ball laying around. Is it, how's about that? You, can that keep you busy for a few hours while we fly out to Ohio and watch Ellie jump over a stack of hedges? Or? <laughs> you know, some of my fondest memories as a child when playing sports um, was the ability to travel to what a certain place. What did you play? Place. What sports did you play as a kid? You know, I, uh, I, back in the day, I played soccer, baseball, and basketball. I pursued basketball to a college level, and then after a couple of years of college, you know, I realized the NBA was not in the future for me, so I retired. You didn't have anyone who pointed that out to you sooner? You no, know, I had to learn on my own after gotcha. a couple of years in college. But, you know, hey, listen, everything leading up to that was incredible because it's very transferable to the game of life, right? I think all sports have a lot of discipline that allows you to learn um, things that others don't learn, you know, that could be applied to the game of life. Well, hold on. Discipline at shooting foul shots is not discipline to run 100 miles. These are real mountains. There is real weather in the Leadville, in the North Face Endurance Challenge, in the Atlantic City map. Atlantic City Marathon. Yeah, that's that? that's too short. We what don't that? we don't count that. Was that a warm up for the Yeah, for the, you know. That was, I know there's five marathons in five days over there you got hanging on the wall. That's a small motivation out of the corner of your eye. Talk about that prep yeah. and what what the mindset that you ta- that you've tapped into, the psyche that you tap into to achieve, to prep, to to perform, to overcome. Talk about that whole experience. Yeah, you know, I think it, it comes down to like everybody has their thing. Right, their thing might be golf, might be boating, might be um, uh, you know whatever it may be, you know. And and my thing happens to be um, and has morphed into this thing called running, long distance running, and um, you know it allows me to uh, become one with myself, become one with nature because I prefer trail running over street running, and I prefer long distance running versus short distance running. So you have a lot of opportunity to either listen to music, which I don't listen to any music whatsoever, zero. I don't listen to any podcasts. I just kind of go out, become one with nature, think about nothing, and kind of zone out. Um, and you probably really do zone out. I mean, over that period of time, you're not just listen, hearing the birds. You probably reach a whole other level, a whole other level of consciousness. I would you, imagine you definitely do, and I think you you also. Um, Someone told me I've never actually been there. You're going to be joining the club soon. That's I would happily re- record behind you in the vehicle, <laughs> in the, the chase vehicle. And, they call it a pacer and a crew, and so you might join that, and that might pacer, be the stepping not stone. The chaser? No, nah. <laughs> that was at the bar last night. Yeah, so. <laughs> um, but you know when you are running these long distance races. Um, there's, there's points of challenge. There's points of dark, dark moments mentally where you don't know when they're going to come or to what extent they're going to happen, but you know that they will happen. And so part of, to me, part of the game, part of the fun, part of the enjoyment, which I know others probably think about it as suffering and um, not so much fun, but is the ability to know that they will happen and then how do you work through them, right? So how do you work through those difficult, challenging times over the course of 30 hours, which is continuous running, um, because there's pockets of time in life as a child, as an adult, where you hit difficult times. And so how do you work through them? Do you kind of lose your cool? Do you kind of um, think about it from a, a different perspective? Do you think about it from a me perspective? Or do you really understand other people involved, other parties involved? Like, Do you really try to help people? Do you really try to troubleshoot something that needs to be fixed. And I think that's transferable to the business that we are in here at Benefit Financial because we provide thinking, we provide insight, we provide thought process to people to help them identify what's important to them and then ultimately not only how to protect it but how to grow their wealth to a point in time where they can ultimately have their wealth produce their income and no longer they produce their income to provide them the lifestyle that they want to be able to enjoy. Now, we could go for the slam dunk point there being talk about purpose driven, talk about meaning in your life and sharing it with your clients. But what I'm thinking is you said a dark place and society has been in a dark place for big pieces of chunks of time over the last few years. Uh, The planet has seen some dark days on our journey over the last two years. You counsel people as they make plans financially, sure, 
but also as they live their lives, as they achieve their dreams, or perhaps they see those dreams torn down. How has that been something that you've tapped into maybe your prep or your training through running where you can connect with clients and coach them through those periods? How does that manifest? I definitely think that with my experience on these ultra uh, races and that world that I subscribe to and play in has helped me you know, get through the last two years that this country has seen and this world has seen, frankly. Um, of course, nobody expected a pandemic to happen and you know, all the sequence of events to follow. Um, but you know, it's, it's a, it's a unplanned life event that we all encountered. And so it's not a function of, you know, what happens out there, but it's a function of how we react to what happens. And so you have to be able to know that there's going to be more points in your life whereby there will be unplanned life events than they're unplanned for a reason, right? They're unexpected. You're not seeing them on the horizon and therefore capable to react, you know, well in advance. So you have to react pretty real time. And when you have to react real time, you have to operate in what's called a calm state, right? And so if you can calm your emotions, your consciousness, which is not an easy thing to do, it's something that I practice every single day. But if you can calm your consciousness and be aware, heighten your awareness, reduce your, you know, your level of anxiety, then you could start to operate in a space where it's, it's enjoyable, it's bigger than you, it's not about you, it's not a me world, it's an others world. And when you care about others more than you oftentimes care about yourself, it starts to become really enjoyable. Don't get me wrong, you have to care about yourself in order to be present to be able to care about others. But you have to also realize that it's not all about me, 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 me. Whether it be money or accolades or uh, cars or whatever material things people try to accumulate. Because there's many people out there that are operating in a me world. It's ultimately from a place of greed. It's a very self-serving place. So if you can move from a selfish world to a selfless world, it becomes a really enjoyable place to swim. Mm. You at some point were a collegiate athlete to an extent. Low level. Low level. I wasn't going to go there. I was just going to say you were a collegiate athlete. I mean, if you played athletics and you went to college, I think that that qualifies, right? Fair enough. Collegiate athlete. Fair enough. So, but now... You're a hardcore, I mean, really, it's, it's, it's many other events, not just the ultra marathon, but it's, it's many events that are endurance, that, that really push your psyche, push your physicality, and you manage a very successful team at Bennett Financial. You, you manage many people's households and their wealth. You manage many people's decision-making as an advisor. How did you get from whatever you were doing in college, which I know wasn't messing around too much and probably was laying off of the bad stuff, but how did you get from there to the life of discipline, the life of advisement, the life of being so well put together? How did you get there? What was that journey like? So if you have a couple of weeks to talk about it, I'm yeah, happy to step into it. volume one. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, you know... I don't really do a great job of, you know, talking about myself, as you know. I do. That's why I like asking you questions to talk about yourself. Right? So you'll get me outside of my comfort zone. But I will tell you that as a young boy, I think it came from my parents because of how I was raised and how I observed them being parents of myself and my two brothers, that discipline is something that is required to hit levels of success. Success to us is not just you know, defined by dollars and cents. There's success is much bigger than that, right? Um, so when I say success, oftentimes it's tied back to dollars and cents and money, right? But success to me is much bigger than that. So when I was able to see that my parents were able to develop a life of success, and a lot of it was attributable to discipline, they have instilled, you know, habits that other people maybe didn't otherwise get exposed to. So I was that when it was snowing out and the driveway had three, four, five, seven, twelve 12 inches of snow, I literally was taking a snow shovel and sh shoveling the snow so I could shoot a couple shots. So like, like I knew that at some point basketball is what I wanted to pursue and I knew in order to pursue it at a higher level, you needed to put the work in, you needed to be disciplined, you know, and if I couldn't shovel the snow, then I'd go into the unfinished basement that we lived in and I would work on my ball handling, you know, and I'd set up cones. Um, and, and so like that, those that's, are the rigors of discipline that started early. 
they happen to start early and carry through. Sure. So I think, you know, it, it becomes really, really important that if there's something that you want to be good at, it's not the decisions that you have to live with. It's the consequences that follow the decisions that you will make that you then have to live with. Mm. So it's the consequences like of the decisions that you have to live with. It's not the decisions themselves, right? Um, and so I think growing up as a young boy and then ultimately realizing that I wanted to run my own business and interact with people. And but did you choose this business early on? You know, because this, it seems like based on that level of discipline, that's probably where people are most are least disciplined, especially in in the state that is ushered so, in, uh, you know, online gambling. So, <laughs> uh, I, I learned that it's very difficult to expect a twenty one year old or twenty year old to come out of undergrad and pick a career path and have them stay in it for the duration of their career. Like, that's really difficult. I don't think it's very common these days. these days, yeah. Um, you know, I've been very fortunate to be able to find this business right out of the gates and through a fail, fair amount of failure in the beginning, a fair amount of uh, luck and a bunch of hard work have been able to get the business to where it is today. Um, and I'm continuing continuously trying to polish you're being, that you're being too humble your clients though would say things like what about you what what have your clients shared with you that stand much that you're probably much more proud about than maybe even some of these medals what have what have been some of the the bits of the experience or the benefit of having you in some the of world? the things that people have said to me is that like if you say you're gonna do something you actually do it which as simple as it is it's not easy they know they can trust you to to follow through if I'm you're going to say scared. something, like if you're going to set expectations and there's going to be follow through, like people want to be in those types of relationships. People don't want to be in empty relationships where you say one thing and you behave a different way, right? Like that's, that's not a good or a bad thing. That's just an empty way to run your life, right? And so people want to make sure that if there's a fulfilled relationship, meaning somebody sets out expectations and then you follow through on those expectations in a way in which it creates value for the end user and a byproduct of that is that your life becomes better as well and only subsequently to helping that other person, that end user, then it becomes a really, really powerful relationship. Mm -hmm. And so I think if we can, <clears throat> every day we wake up, operate with that mantra and in that context, like not only are clients gonna enjoy working with us, <clears throat> but they're gonna wanna share the work and the experience with other people that they care about, right? And that's where 100% of our new business growth over the last 20 plus years has come from high level introductions from existing clients. And I think that's really important to us because we're able to create sticky, meaningful relationships that creates value. And value to us is defined in way, let me define value. It's, it's, it's helping people take action on things that they were not otherwise gonna take action on. Okay. Or, and or helping people learn about things that they didn't otherwise know about. Because this whole thing of like, hey, how do you create value? How do you create value? People throw it around with zero substance. Sure. So if you're gonna say we're gonna create value, what does that mean? We could define it. Right. And so Creating through the- value isn't just hosting the event and, and putting out some food and leaving everybody in the room, but moving them to take action on something that they weren't so sure of before they arrived at that event or that meeting or what have you but now they're certain they need to move forward. But people may be certain around taking action on something, and I'll give you an example, concrete for our viewers and for yourself, um, that they wanna do it, they wanna do it, they wanna do it, but they just don't have some level of professional accountability in their life to help get that done, and then we would enter into their world and help them get that done, so that's one area of value. Another area is just to help them on something that they didn't otherwise know about, mm. or that Google never proactively brought to their attention, Yes. right? But an example on the first of most people, most responsible human beings, want to make sure that they have proper estate planning done that's in line with what their desires and objectives may be, right? They know they have something that they've amassed, they've accumulated, and they're fearful of it being either eroded or taxed or squandered. Sure. And therefore, they need to have a plan in place. Sure. And by the way, just tied it back to like the decisions and the consequence point that we had made. Yeah. Like, should you not take action and develop an estate plan? Well, 
the, the government of this country and or the state that you live in will have a plan for you. And that's the consequence. And that's the consequence, which yeah. doesn't make it a terrible thing. You get to thing. a point, but now you're stuck with the consequence of you'll get the plan that they give you. Right. So most everybody, I'd be shocked if somebody authentically said, I don't want an estate plan. So people, single, married, kids, no kids, a lot of money, little money, doesn't matter. People want to have a plan. So if we enter into their life and we help them get that done that's in line with their objectives, people see that as valuable. And by the way, we make no money. No revenue comes into our firm as a result of doing that. So you lead with that. We care about them, inspire them to help them complete that because if that's not completed in their life, then their life is incomplete. So if we can help them complete their life in various ways in which they weren't otherwise going to complete their life, we become valuable to them. And that's something that we don't take lightly. Well, you're also not a wag your finger at somebody type of coach, you know, and just to, to get back to the coaching theme, you're, you're coaching them by way of bringing real value up front, but by also modeling those behaviors and, and ushering them through those the, those initial steps that must happen to achieve that security and that planning, right? that level of planning. That's right. And people don't want to be told what to do, but people want to be led. Yeah. So people don't want to be told what to do, but they want to be led. And the way in which you we find leading in an effective way is to help people self-discover what's possible and for them to want to then take action on that, right? And so there's a whole art and a science, frankly, that's tied back to that. And it's something that I'm constantly working on and developing. It's something that I haven't mastered by any stretch of the imagination. But this industry, this work, this this line of business allows for me to practice it every single day and try to refine my skill set mm -hmm. so that we can continue to grow and have a successful business. I'm going to accumulate the dishes and books oh, and that photos. Stuff, from you know, all that that stuff, silly, silly no, stuff. I, it, 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 but, but it does serve a purpose because along the way, People want to feel that you're not, you don't just have it all together yourself. Right. And, well, you've got it and that's it. They want to see that there's others around you. They want to feel like, okay, well, there's different shapes and sizes. There's different ways that this can be done, but it all hovers around the same set of either steps or a process. Right. And you have a very unique process that you lead with that value proposition up front. Right. Right. And we touch on every possible area in one's financial life that they could think about. Many of the decisions that they've made before we meet are decisions that are done in a vacuum, meaning they make a decision with, without fully understanding how that decision impacts other areas of their financial life. So they create, a, they, they look at a decision and they make it in the absence of everything else going on in their life, which is a very common way that people make financial decisions. So when we try to help them think about it in a more integrated and a coordinated way so that they're not only protected, they're growing their wealth and they're able to future, you know, be in a position where they could future, uh, be, in, be able to distribute their wealth in their future, then it becomes a, you know, it's a different process. It's a different conversation. It's a different narrative. It's a different philosophy. So we often get, how are you different? How are you different? Right? Sure, like sure. any business, any industry may encounter that, right? And it comes down to two things. It's the philosophy that which would, that which we live by, and it's a narrative that which we speak by. Hmm. And we're happy to then go on to, you know, what does that mean? But we don't then just start to vomit <laughs> right. to the person that we're talking about what that means. We do it in a conversational manner, which I think people appreciate and want that more than just being pitched. Right, because we live in a world where everybody's getting pitched on everything. Uh, everyone's getting pitched, and I, I believe the marketplace, certainly in the areas that we live and, and largely uh, around the country now, people are savvy. They have the ability. We talked about a, a do-it-yourselfer that we know in yeah. common. Um, the ability to either do it yourself or to be the smartest person in the room and not listen to an advisor or a team of advisors is a heck of a lot more tempting than actually surrendering a little bit to someone else's process that's proven it. Right. But you do it in a way that's very natural. Right. And you lead with those communication uh, signals that let them feel like you're not going to be telling them what to do. You're going to be leading them. You're going to be showing them because you've achieved it, but also because you do it in other facets of your life. You have the discipline. You, you prepare. You go through the rigors in all of these other aspects of your life as, a, as, a, as an athlete, as an endurance event 
uh, aficionado, uh, psycho. <laughs> As I keep saying that, I shouldn't. There's probably uh, someone out there is taking offense. Um, not you. But, uh, and as, as, a, as a parent, as a husband, as a member of the community, you are diligent about delivering on the promises you make. You are diligent about preparing and putting together a plan to take action. But you leave room for spontaneity and you're very authentic in how you carry it. You're certainly less buttoned up than I am today. I feel like overdressed in the. Uh, uh, you, 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 your, your threads look beautiful. They look well, beautiful on you. Gentlemen's Quarterly didn't tell me that they were going to be outfitting you for that <laughs> program. It would have been nice if they left a, you know, a, a, a size small on the hanger for me. You do know that I'm into my threads, and so you uh, are, yeah. All, and I would imagine still custom. Uh, certainly, those socks look much better <laughs> than the socks that I have to store bought. You know, they're probably just made for the random size 10 foot. You know, yours are fit around each toe. Oh, I don't know. They, uh, <laughs> if they feel good, then they, they we'll are good. You know? <laughs> um, let's talk about, I, I want to I talk about your mindset in particular, how you coach yourself. Because you're out there running for 30 hours it's solo time. I mean, I know you do have people that you run with. You have a, what do you call it? Your tribe? Do you call a group? Do you have a group that you run with regularly? Or uh, no, I do a lot of my training and my really running cool. on my own. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. you're, I've, I've seen some random footage here and there of you with some other, you know, wayward soul at 3 a.m. If the, you know, the headlamp on, but most of the time it's you. So how do you coach yourself through those difficult times? How do you get into that deep state? You know, it's kind of like brushing your teeth in the morning. It's not like brushing your teeth. I brush my teeth every day. <laughs> for you for me, it is. Miles <laughs> for, for, for me, the decision yeah. to train accordingly mm-hmm. and insert myself intentionally into it's that world, habitual for you. It's, it's like brushing my teeth. Now, to your point, yes, I understand it's not a universal approach. No, but early on as kids, kids, I have one kid, we, we, I marvel at how many brown teeth she has. Luckily... Uh, anatomy will push those out and she will you know shed them and hopefully the second batch she'll, right. she'll take better care of but she's not finding the enjoyment yet she doesn't have to worry about kissing anybody she doesn't worry about talking close to anyone you know she certainly doesn't have to worry about anybody telling her she's bad breath right three feet high right but as you go through life you learn the importance of having you know good dental hygiene by the way just as an aside on teeth i gotta yes. t- i gotta throw this in you there have beautiful teeth by the way well you know i i was with my eight-year-old uh, over the weekend, and she was really close to me, and she's like, Dad, did you ever have braces? And I've never had braces. I always wanted braces, but I never had them. And I guess it was partially because the dentist or the orthodontist didn't think it was appropriate. But I think, candidly, it was also because my parents had paid for braces on, for my older brother. And there was nothing left. And there was nothing left. That's why Alaire plays soccer. That's right. You know, you know, you know the routine. So... Um, so, you know, I think teeth do matter when, but you may not learn about that, that they matter until later in life, you know, yeah, uh, because, yeah. you know, people want to have clean teeth or straight teeth or whatever you call it, you know. But it becomes important somewhere along the way, somebody says, get that breath away from me or get that broccoli out of your teeth. It's embarrassing. Someone laughs when you're on stage, whatever. But that experience and that, that culmination of experiences, you get up in the morning and like you said, habitually you brush. Mm. So you have had, you've experienced a high, you've experienced a mental clarity while running. You've done things inside your dome that are different than during the normal person's existence or course of daily life. And therefore, getting up in the morning to run isn't a requirement that you feel like you have to do. Yeah. It's like you feel like you have to do it. So a few things that I would point out to you. Number one, um, as a result of my desire and my decision to train, it makes me think with more clarity. And it's scientifically proven, not by me, but by a doctor that looked at the chemistry, that if you take care of your physical... It's a lot of that going on these days. Yes. If you take care of your physical well-being, your mental well-being will also likely be at a yeah. higher probability of being healthy. Sure. Right? So, and I'm very aware that there's a direct correlation scientifically for me. So if I don't train, like I know what I can expect, you know, as it relates to not thinking clearly or um, not feeling strongly about the way I see the world mentally, right? So there's a direct correlation. So I don't want to find myself going into that foggy state. And so I know that one of the things that helps me prevent myself from going there is to do this training, right? I think also I want to be around for a long time to hang out with my kids, grandkids, and great-grandkids. And I know that 
you know, my, my ticket could be pulled at any point. But the reality is if I make a decision, like an intentional decision to be healthy, according to the way that I see the world of being healthy, like it, it creates a higher probability that I'll be, a, I'll be around for a long time. It doesn't guarantee it, but it increases my chances of being around for a long time. Sure. So I'd like to be around for a long time. And so, you know, I think it's that. And then so you mentioned training and working out and doing this stuff early on. I made a decision years and years ago that I didn't want to compromise other domains of my life to be able to give this domain the attention that I wanted to give it. So I typically wake up at 4, start training at 4.30, I'm done at around 5.30 every morning. A lot of times the family's not even awake. Oh, yeah. So I didn't want to sacrifice family time. I didn't want to take away from my business. I didn't want to. So th that's just what's worked for me. Now on the back end, to be clear, <laughs> full disclosure, 9 to 9.30, the eyes yeah, are closed. Yeah. And I get a lot of heckling from people in my world sure. because they're like, dude, you literally go to bed at like lunchtime. I'm like, well, yeah. you know, I also wake up fairly early. Sure. So th there's got to be an understanding. You know, now at some point in the not so distant future, and it's maybe happened a few times to both, because my wife likes to, you know, try to go to bed earlier and wake up early, not maybe as early as I, but my wife and I were having a conversation. There's a good chance our kids will be putting us to bed. Not too soon. Like they're going to be going to bed after us and we're sure. going to be like, Hey guys, That's you it. can tuck us we're in. Give us a good, we're going to bed. You know, <laughs> the house is locked, you know, everything's good. Yeah. You know? yeah. For sure, so, they're uh, at that point. I, yeah. Ours certainly, we don't have any uh, governors on the back end of the day. They do sleep in, which is nice, but the back end, it's it's a the, I call it the negotiating, starts around like you know eight thirty nine o'clock for the, with the kids. Well, and, tell me how to get them to sleep in because we haven't figured that out because our kids are. But um, be okay or or be able to stay up with them <laughs> <laughs> late because then they need to sleep in. Right, yeah. right. But you know, the, uh, there's plenty of folks who put their kids down around seven eight o'clock. Right, and I mean, unless we've had a full day at the at the beach, it's very difficult. I don't. I, I could probably count on one hand how many times my kids have been asleep before eight p.m. <laughs> uh, that just doesn't happen in our house. No, it's good. I mean, it's all it's all there's, good stuff. There's a lot of that that balances out as well because not just the physical rigors, but it's the health, it's the consumption, what you're putting in your body. I'm going to test your will in a little bit, um, but then there's also the sleep, and there's what you're putting on your tape. You know, as we say, my brother-in-law has, has a great saying of like, I don't want that on my tape. There's just things he won't allow. He won't watch certain movies and, and let certain genres sneak in. He doesn't want to, he knows it exists. He's not ignorant to it. And he's certainly not uh, naive. I, but I have enough. I, mm -hmm. I have the memory file. I can always retrieve that one if I need to. I don't need to continue to run that reel for stimulation, you know, and tempt whatever comes with it. And that's... That's, that's really key in the discipline of the life that you lead, Justin. I thank you for that. I get a lot of flack from my study group. Now, my study group is made up of eight uh, business owners all over the country, all in the same industry, operating the same space. We've known You've each other for, for, quite for 15 plus years. Yeah. Um, very successful. Real good friends, you know, very open and sharing and caring type of an environment, which I know other industries can't even fathom that at times. But, you know, we could be perceived as competitors from the outside sure. world. But where I'm going with it is, you know, I get a lot of flack from all these guys who um, will oftentimes make movie references or television show references. I watch this much television. Nothing, zero, nothing, nada, right? It's just a decision that I've made. Sure. And I don't watch movies because in the first six minutes in a dark room, I'll fall asleep. <laughs> Suffer from a similar uh, narcolepsy. Yeah. So neither of those two. So, you know, I just, you know, don't find myself ever watching Netflix or TV or, you know, uh, Dancing with the Stars or I don't even know what's on these days. You, you know, I mean, my, I joke with people. I say, last movie I watched was E.T. You know, I, <laughs> I don't even know when that thing came out. <laughs> Oh my gosh. That's probably not very far off having known you for a bit. Um, so you mentioned your study group and it's a group of eight? Yes. That's been together for... F seven. Sorry. Seven. seven. That's yeah. okay. Well, we didn't like him anyway. Yeah. Um, so seven of you who've been together for the better part of 15 years? Yeah. I mean, I'm one of the newer of the two to the group, but yes, I think even longer. The core has been around for more than that. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they, they actually, there was somebody passed and, I, and you got voted. I got lucky. Look I got lucky. I begged. I begged. There you go. I, I'm sure you gravel. <laughs> uh, so talk about what that's been like because there's a chance to both learn from others but also teach others and that's pretty daunting. It's one thing to learn from others where you go in and you know you have your hand up a little bit and you take 
especially from people who've been down the path before, I find it more daunting, and, I, and I'd love to hear your perspectives on having to actually bring, as you say to clients, value to the group. Yeah. Help inspire them, lead them. Sure, and I think the group operates from the perspective that we all share similar outlooks in the world whereby we, we give more than we take. So if you can give more than you could take, then it's actually a very enjoyable place to be. Mm -hmm. And so because we look at you know, the, the, the seven of us in a way in which we're always looking to give and improve one another, it's, a, it's an enjoyable place to be. Now, of course, if one of the members you know, when, wanted to just take, 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 it, it just wouldn't work for them. It wouldn't work for the rest of the group. Sure. But because we're always giving, it's... It would probably naturally present, though. Totally. And you'd know going in. It's not like you're randomly thrown together at, 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 uh, without, without having background. And like you said, very well screened, I'm sure, before. Totally, totally. And so it balances and finds its equilibrium. It does. And it's, it's also, at times, a lonely business. Right when you're running a business inside of this industry, or I'm sure running businesses in other industries, you know, and you're 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 owning and running and operating a bit. I mean, it, it could be lonely at times. So it creates a forum that which you can you know talk to other people and um, maybe not find yourself so lonely at times when you know you want you want to reach out to somebody. We have standing monthly calls. We have an annual formal gathering that lasts over four days at times and. You know, formal agenda tied to that. We bring in outside speakers. Um, you know, coupled with the probably daily uh, text thread of just talking about life, not just the business, but life. So, sure. it, it's just a lot of um, it's just a lot of companionship, both personally and professionally. That I think we all get a lot out of, and it's got to be a natural thing, like you were saying. So, so the group has come together very naturally. It, you can't insert, you know, a kind of an outlier of a personality into a group like that, expect that it's going to be a favorable, a favorable outcome. So although... But how important is it for not just you in your career and in your life that you've, that you've experienced this, how important would you say it is for others to maybe try and seek this out? I'm always talking to clients in other manufacturing, doctors, dentists, uh, recycling companies. I mean, like I'm talking to all these folks about this idea, right, of forming a study group within their respective industry and through conversation they love the idea but they don't even know where to start because oftentimes it becomes a very competitive you know world so somebody that's running a very large recycling company here in New Jersey might know somebody down in Texas that's also running but they might look at themselves even though they're you know 1400 miles apart they might look at themselves as competitors and like, I don't want to open up to him, and he doesn't want to open up to me. And so it maybe never gets off the ground, yeah. right? So I think it... it, it There's it, a little bit of that... Uh, sure. Which, I, you know, I, I, I get it. Hoarding you know? or yeah. hovering over, as opposed to operating from a position of abundance and saying there's much to be learned here. We can draw up guidelines and, and guardrails to keep everyone safe and moving forward on the path and not, you know absconding with uh, trade secrets. Absolutely. And it's not just the study group, the national study group that I'm part of. I mean, I'm, I think we talked about it a little bit before we jumped on here. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, I made a conscious decision to join another peer advisory type group, which has no other folks from you know, my industry and it has all different industries represented, all business owners and or high level executives that are part of this group. It's facilitated by a chairperson mm -hmm. um, who's a remarkable human being and does an incredible job um, and so you can find yourself you know part of that group in fact I've referred many clients to that group to have a conversation with the chairperson to see if it makes sense for them to join the group or join a different group or explore what's possible because I think if you don't form if you can't form an organic study group it's still okay you could still find a peer advisory group that you can get you know value and benefit from and it could be done in a more you know formally structured way um, and, and so I, I would continuously refer clients of ours and people that I come across that own businesses to talk to, you know, these peer advisory groups and see if it's something that's for them. It's not for everybody, but it, you know, the, no, but, but in the spirit of constant and never ending improvement of pushing yourself a little bit farther of unlocking some of the, those doors and again, bringing value, as you said earlier, uh, moving you to take action on something that you otherwise wouldn't have taken action on if you were left alone. Right. Uh, so 
yes, outside of, I would say most people's comfort groups, uh, comfort zones, even if you're already comfortable being in a setting, you may not be comfortable hearing difficult feedback right. or accurate feedback, as right. I like to call it. You may not, reality may be a little bit of a, of a pill to swallow. What are, you, what are you most concerned about? What are you most focused on right now in the world? Would it be weird if I tell you that I operate from a place of no concern? No, I think that's great. With, without operating from a place of ego? So it's, it's, uh, it's not perfect, meaning I haven't perfected that. But, you Do you know, have to hit a symbol when you say that or something? <laughs> or no? Is that a... you, you know, th the world is going to be the world that we're in. Obviously, we could, we could develop the life that we want to be able to live and then step into it. Yeah. Right? So we're going to talk a little bit of ontological speak, if you want. If you will. Wow. Um, I have to put that across the bottom of the screen. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, the world's going to be what the world's going to be, and, and we need to figure out the life that we want to be able to live inside of this bigger world that we're finding ourselves, right? I mean, we only have one shot to live in this three-dimensional form called the body and move through this time, right? I mean, that, that, that's all we have, right? Time and space at the end of the day is all we have. So, um, you know, I just think that if, if you... If you operate with this ongoing concern, little or large, it's just going to lead to more concern, right? So we happen to be all five of us, my wife, myself, our three kids, were in an airplane recently and a um, very aggressive, abrupt form of turbulence came on and you know, my wife lost it. The middle guy thought it was fun like a roller coaster. Most people on the plane completely, you know, baffle them and I'm sitting there trying to calm my other two and trying to remain calm myself, right? So mm. like it could have been, we had another hour and a half left on the flight. I could have been operating from a place of concern like, oh my gosh, what if we hit another pocket of turbulence? But you know, I, I didn't, you know, I knew that I could have gone down that road, right. but I was very aware of my thoughts and I subscribed to a different way of thinking, which was, you know, this is just the flight home and we're going to have to get home and there's either going to be turbulence or there's not going to be turbulence. Yeah. But I wasn't like, oh my gosh, I'm concerned that my wife may vomit on our oldest child because she's sitting next to him and she screamed, oh, dad, no. mom's going to throw up. Like, like I could have gone down that path. Sure. But, you know, it was very difficult, but yet I think fulfilling to not operate from a place of concern. Well, and turbulence being a metaphor for health concerns in the family or having... Um, uh, an issue with your children and navigating that over several weeks. You know, that's a, it's a metaphor. Uh, the gaps in the uncomfortable pockets of air are metaphors for when things are going really well. And do you let yourself enjoy those moments and, and relax and, and soak it in? Or are you still thinking about when's the next pocket of turbulence coming? Totally. Don't get me wrong. I get a lot of butterflies every time I tow the line of a 100-mile race mm. because it's only natural. I'm very aware, right? It's very similar to back in the day. Things can go wrong. About sure. to play a big basketball game, sporting event, or otherwise, sure. and you want it to go well. Like right. you want it to end in a form of success, whatever success may be for you in that instance. But every time I toe the line, like I want to complete within the time that's allotted, the end. And it's a long, it's a long time, time and, and a lot, lot can go right. No control. Right. So I do get the butterflies, but I need to be able to be aware of that, calm them, and then be able to move forward, but not operate from a place of concern that, hey, sure. I may bonk this race. I may contract pulmonary edema and be rushed to the hospital, which many people do when you race at altitude and you're not eating properly and you're at, you know, you're losing oxygen. I mean, it, there's so many things that can go wrong. Sure. Right. So need to be able to, you know, Just calm your... wildlife, something basic. Right. Lose your footing, some, some freak little accident. How many times, you know, accomplish people, something very, very simple takes them off the trail or whatever it is. So concern is, to me, a healthy thing in that it, if you, if you are aware of it and you're able to use it to your advantage, it's okay, but you don't want to allow concern to overtake your way of being, your way of operating, your way of thinking, your mindset, because it will... It, it wants to, and it will if you allow it to. So you'd say you're most concerned about diminishing the impact of negative thought, of fear, of stress in your world, and focus very much thereby on dealing with it as it comes because you trust in your preparation, you trust in your ability to make decisions on the fly, 
and you know that the best environment for you to do that in would be from a place of acceptance of the world around you as opposed to, well, it's a good thing I was really freaked out about this because now it's happening and I'm, I'm less prepared to, I'm less equipped to react appropriately. Absolutely. Yeah. Deep. That, that, was, that was pretty deep, brother. I appreciate you sharing. You got it, my man. With me. So tell me about Yope. Mm -hmm. Because your optimal personal economy is way more important than whatever we're being fed by Fortune or CNBC or whatnot. And I was on the inside of CNBC. I'm an alum, right? As you know, through Andy and other, other people. Uh, I mean, no, no disrespect to anybody who goes on CNBC as a commentator, but we know that that's a one-size-fit-all or a I have an agenda opportunity to throw some things out there. Yep. And what doesn't necessarily happen is people don't get dialed into what really should matter most for their own financial matters. So yeah, Yope. Yope. Yope is uh, a podcast that, um, that I host. And um, as you mentioned, your optimal personal economy. Uh, we're closing in on 100 episodes. And the, the idea is that we uh, not only talk about you know, money decisions and money matters and financial decisions and the work that we do professionally, but it's actually created a little bit of a lifestyle flair to it where whether it be reflecting on a 100-mile race or talking about a situation that we encountered as a parent of a child who's playing on a competitive you know, team or as a coach and kind of relating it back more to lifestyle because I think people appreciate and want um, to know that their financial professional has some element of humanness tied back to them. And so we, we talk about you know, matters like that. We also have started to invite guests like yourself onto the show. Thank you. Um, and we, we're, we're looking to build up a little bit more momentum with getting additional guests onto the show so that we can start to ask guests. But we're trying to be picky on the guests that we invite because we know that we want the, the, the podcast to have a certain message, a certain culture, a certain philosophy to it. So we don't want to just bring in somebody because they have 25 million followers on Instagram, you know, which I think ties back to this whole idea of dual personality. We see that very often, unfortunately, where people are chasing uh, visibility. It's yep. a popularity contest. People are chasing visibility that doesn't necessarily attach to any of the, the ends that they're after, but they're so focused on the means right now and the means making them feel good and I got 10 thumbs up and why didn't I get more comments? And, and that's what they become either excited about or excited for and anticipating, or they become almost uh, they, they experience dejection and rejection if it, if it isn't met that way. Instead of knowing the course and saying, we're going to stick to this because we know we're speaking into a particular audience's listening. Right. And I know you do that very well with your clientele. The type you have blue collar millionaires, you have uh, very high level, high performers and executives and founders and leaders of companies. And you also have people in the community. So you've got a hit on what matters most to them. And you found that common thread with Yope. It, it, we have, and it, it works great because it, you know, helps people uh, remember why they've made certain decisions that they've made over our working relationship, which in some cases is twenty plus years. Um, and it's it's just candidly, I you know, like much like we're doing here with your podcast, you know, it goes back to the days where like you, you have a business, and if you didn't have a website, you'd kind of kind of like eh, I don't know sure. about that business, Validation. but like. Yeah, right. Like credibility, validation. So um, I, I think it's important. You know, I think it's important. And so, um, you know, I, I think our marketing folks have told us that we're, you know, 30 or 40,000 downloads over the, you know, 90 plus episodes. So Very we're nice. trying to, you know, continue to make sure that it's valuable to the listeners, right? So uh, to your point, we want to make sure that people are listening and they, they find value in it. And what's very rewarding is that a client happens to lip, listen to an episode, whether it be a current or an old, and they just send us a note. Hey, listen to this episode. It was so cool. Or they, they make a comment about it. I mean, how rewarding is that? We have what's called the final stretch. What we like to do are keeping on the, uh, keeping on, don't worry, these are really innocuous. Keeping in the horse theme and the race, the polio race, the final stretch is when we uh, round that fourth turn and we ask those last bunch of questions just to hear very quick responses. Whatever comes to mind first, don't worry if it's accurate, inaccurate, or whatnot. I was doing this to the protein bars in the box. 
Yeah, no, don't worry. You're going to have those in just a minute. <laughs> this is just the lead on. Yeah, they're definitely having a bite of You could deal with it. You could go take it, get rid of it in the bathroom. Um, so here we are, final stretch. First paid job. I was a, uh, I was working for my dad. Doing my dad, he was a landscape nurseryman. Man, a pretty big business as a landscaper. You just say you were mowing lawns. You don't have to make it sound. He so did not have a lawn service division. <laughs> he owned, lawn service division. He, he didn't. He That's had good. 15 acres. So he what had, did you do? Like clip topiaries? Or? No, we, we, I literally would put mulch in a wheelbarrow and bring it to, you know, the bed and spread the mulch. But before we did that, my dad would lay out and his foreman would lay out the plants and I'm digging and wow. taking the pots out, dropping them in, putting the fertilizer in, putting the, you know. Digging ditches and moving dirt. I love it. That was my first paid digging job. Dirt. Does your manicurist know that you used to get your, your fingers dirty? <laughs> um, <laughs> advise your, I don't even want to see your toes. Uh, yeah, running they, them they, out, you run. They, they, fall, off, they, fall, off, they, back, they oh fall off, they grow back, they fall off, they grow back. Still red. <laughs> uh, what would you advise, and not necessarily financially, but it could be, what would you advise your 20-year-old self? So a little bit before we met. Knowing what I know now? Uh, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully leveraging your awareness, yeah. Um, I, would, uh, I would say that... Um, be okay with failure. Be okay with failure. Who is or are your rocks? Certainly my wife. Um, definitely my parents, um, even to this day. Um, my, my kids certainly fall into that mix. And um, there's, there's uh, a couple of other people that are you know, just in my world, just through my travels. Um, that I talk to on a daily basis. So I think people that I talk to on a daily basis are... are Having them present. Yeah. yeah you rely yeah. on that. Yeah. That's great. Obviously, you're a financial advisor, but you could take this metaphorically um, or speak in, in, in any venue. $10,000 must be invested. Where do you put it? In the absence of any other money? I, should, I guess I can't answer a question with a question, right? Just answer the question. Savings account. Savings account. Okay. Uh, we won't flash Bennett Financial. Doc. Is it BennettFinancial.com? It is Bennett FG. Bennett FG Financial okay. Group. Com. Yeah. Yes, I knew that. Yeah. I've had to, I used to have to type that out. When I, emailed <laughs> it. I, would, I would type that out with my two. Um, BennettFG.com. All time favorite meal. Pizza, if I had to pick one. Oh, you don't eat pizza. Would you stop? <laughs> Current playlist. I, I didn't say I currently eat it, but of all time. <laughs> all time favorite. I'm on, I'm, I'm on death row. I may as well have pizza. <laughs> I mean, it's finally come to a conclusion. Uh, Current playlist. Or book or podcast. Ah, uh, Yope, Your Optimal Personal Economy. I heard it's a good one. That is really a sharp program. Yes. I heard it's a really good one. Your own personal economy. Your optimal. Your optimal. Personal your, economy. Your optimal. Yope. Yo, yeah, I think you could find it at any one of those uh, uh, podcast stores that they call them. You yeah, know, the yeah, little yeah. rotunda things. In yeah, there, yeah, 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 yeah. We'll come back to that and, and get that in. What was the last live concert show or event that you attended? Beach Boys, the PNC Art Center. Right up in Home Down here. Yeah. Interesting. They're probably still kicking around. Probably 37 Is years John ago. John Stamos playing with them? <laughs> I don't know any of them. I just remember my parents bringing me to the Beach Boys. Goodness. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> favorite app? I'm not a big pop culture guy. Favorite yeah. app? Um, I'm sure you've used a few bits of technology in your... Yeah, favorite app. Gosh, these are really good questions. Um, favorite app? Uh, maybe the photo roll? Okay. How will your 80-year-old self, so a couple years from now, how will your 80-year-old self describe your life? Complete. Before I even, finish, or just as I finish the sentence. So we've come to the part of the program, Justin, where you must submit, <laughs> you must submit as not only the guest, but the host of this episode of Coaching Conversations that can only, it's not Coaching Conversation and, and Granola Bar. It's not Coaching Conversation and Smoothie. We it's Coaching Conversations and Cannoli. Okay. <laughs> and so we have a very special box of cannoli here that was brought in from our good friends at Boyano Bakery in Mamaroneck. Uh, neighboring town and I'd like to at least get you to take a bite of one of these I know it's gonna be tough you're like I can't believe he's doing this cut the camera but look at how delectable we went with the minis though we is there cream cheese the in there 
There's no cream cheese in it. No? This is all, this is like chickpea, ground chickpea <laughs> with cassava flour. Let me, let me take a peek. And uh, just, just take a little look. Oh, you can even man. smell. Look at that. There's not even a calorie. Wow. You can you just take a bite. What about a bite of one and then I'll cut the we'll cut the camera after you, one bite. You asked me for the name of some people in my life that are like my rocks and one of them, well I said my parents, but one of my parents local, is my dad. The local pastry guy? <laughs> he he taught me that if you put it up to your nose and it doesn't pass a sniff test, it doesn't go into your mouth. Should we this give it? Definitely, this should, definitely we give it should we give it the sniff test? This definitely passes the <laughs> sniff test. It smells amazing. It smells like everything you shouldn't be eating a lot of. I can smell it. You can smell it. It doesn't mm. repulse you. No, but if those, I have to confess, if those were soft chocolate chip cookies, you would have no chance in eating any of them. I would have eaten all of them. Really? That's your weak spot. But that's 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 going to be change a the marketing. It's coaching <laughs> conversations and soft chocolate. S cookie. Soft chocolate chip cookies. Soft chocolate chip cookies. So it's going to be C C and S C C C. And everybody in my that's world knows that it's my biggest confession. That is. You know, but it's got to be it's got to be chewy. If it's crunchy, I've I'm noticed not. you've done a lot of talking. You haven't done any grabbing or eating yet. I'm going to save those for you. Let Are me you, see. You me... really going to push? And that's I know... not going to happen. <laughs> uh, you have to join me on this. I want to break your will over my knee with a cannoli. I'm not going to eat it, but I'll hold it. You could just take a little I'll lick pet of it. it. Just a little, I'll pet a little it. lick of it. Is it against what do I do with a this? religious thing? You what, do you, what do you typically do with this thing? You put it in your mouth. It's very heavy. Chew. What's in there? I don't even know. I think it's, um, I think it's uh, cauliflower. Yeah? Actually. Yeah, I think it's raw cauliflower. <laughs> You're not going to just a little, a little Cheers. touch? Cheers, baby. Bump, bump cannolis real quick. <laughs> <laughs> you got to take a bite, no? Let's take a bite. This is when I jump in. This is when I push my kids in the pool. <laughs> How is it? Good? Mm. I feel healthier already. You know what? I'm going to take your word for it. Wow. <laughs> Shut down on my own show. But you know what? I expect it nonetheless. I really did. Can I lick my finger? I, thought I, was gonna, I think you should. I think you should smear it all over your hand and then eat it. <laughs> <laughs> I did expect nothing less. You are a man of not only extreme discipline, but also you do what you say. And when you say you keep your training regime tight, when you say you really watch what goes in your body, when you say you brush your teeth so you don't get creamy stuff all over it, you do it. And, uh, and that's pretty impressive. As much as I might, I have, I'm resisting the urge to feel offended and instead, I feel great respect for you, as I always have. I, I really, really appreciate, you know, you invited me onto your show. This has been incredible. That's okay. A lot of fun. Except for the cannoli part. You well, a little pressured. You just pressure. might have a little bit more work to do. You know. This. What if I just leave that I, I, I assure you, <laughs> chocolate chip cookies, done. I'm gonna ask Sue if these disappeared. Please do. Mysteriously. I won't even know. walk down there and you could just, she, I don't want to see her reaction. <laughs> I know, I know. Good stuff, man. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Thanks we for We bro hug it out. You got it, brother. <laughs>